his intention was always to bring in people who were blind and deaf and dead in their sins and followed the ways of false religion. And uh, it is reason for us to, to celebrate and rejoice and to praise our God. Psalm 96 is most likely penned by David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because we find uh, parts of this psalm in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 15. And he writes... In Psalm 96, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the, world, the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Our song of preparation is number 187. Number 187, Sing to the Lord, Sing His Praise, All Ye Peoples. It's based, of course, on Psalm 96. And at this time, we will arise only to sing the first three stanzas of number 187. As usual, congregation, if you're able to, please keep your Bibles open to Psalm 96 as we walk through this passage this morning. It gets a little complicated at times, and if you have the Bibles open, uh, you're, it's easy to, uh, makes it uh, a little bit easier to follow along and to, um, to reference what, uh, what we're saying. Beloved children of the living God, Psalm 96 reminds us that we were not an afterthought. We were not God's plan B. So that if the, the things didn't work out with these people, Israel, then at least there's these other people. It reminds us that we are not the, 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 the fruit of, of God's failed plan with Israel. That Israel somehow rejected Jesus, and then God says, well, okay then, if you, if you don't want what I have to give you, then I'll just give it to charity. If you don't want to be saved, then I guess I'll have to save these other people. Not at all. That's not the way it worked. It was always God's plan. And Psalm 96 reminds us of that. It was always God's plan to build His church from every nation, tribe, and tongue, including the nation of Israel. All of us, after all, came from the one man, Adam, 
to whom the original promise of salvation was given. And all of us are included when God says to Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It is we, the church, made up of Jewish and Gentile believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who are like the stars in the heavens and the sand on the seashore which cannot be counted. And so Psalm 96 is really prophetic. It's looking ahead to the time when the kingdom of God would be set in motion by the ministry of Jesus Christ and the Lord God, the Almighty God, would begin to draw in the nations of the world. And so our theme as we look at Psalm 96 this morning is this, the true God calls the nations to acknowledge Him. The true God calls the nations to acknowledge Him. We'll see in the first place that we're called to acknowledge God with praise and adoration and in the second place with fear and awe. But as the true God calls the nations to acknowledge Him, we see in the first place that they, that is we, are to do that with praise and adoration. In Psalm 96, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, David addresses the nations of the world, calling them to join with Israel to praise and adore the true and living God. And notice that all through Psalm 96, if you have your Bibles open, he uses the sacred name of God throughout this psalm. Now, of course, if you look at your English Bibles, you see the word Lord, but you see it in uh, capitalized letters. But in the Hebrew, David, and, and that's meant, it's, uh, this is always the way it's translated in our English Bibles. In the Hebrew, David uses the sacred name of God, Yahweh. And that's translated in our English translations. When that name is used, uh, the Lord, in capitalized letters. And so uh, the first thing we want to notice is that because David uses the sacred name of God and he calls all people to come to this Lord and sing his praises, we have to understand that this is not a general call to people of the world, you know, to get religious, you know, find some spirituality. I remember a quote from uh, Mother Teresa who lots of people uh, put a lot of uh, stock in and, and have a, a high esteem for, and yet she was quoted one time uh, of, as saying to the people in India, she says, whatever your religion is, you'll be the best at it. If you're a Hindu, be the best Hindu you can be. If you're a Muslim, be the best uh, Muslim you can be. If you're a Christian, be the best Christian that you can be. That's not what the Bible says. And that's not the call of David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. It's not find some religion. It's come to know the true and living God, the only God. In uh, verses 1 to 3, David writes, O sing to the Lord, again, the sacred name of the Lord, a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day, declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all peoples. And notice as well, too, that David here addresses all the earth. Now, in the Bible, when the word uh, is used that's translated earth, uh, it can refer sometimes to the created world in which we live, the physical planet earth on which we live. But more often, when the Bible, especially the Old Testament, speaks of the earth, it refers to the peoples of the earth. And in the Old Testament, as we know, there was a very strong division among people, among humankind. There was Israel, and there were those who were outside of Israel, everybody else for that matter. There was the nation of Israel, and there were the nations of the world, the rest of the nations. Israel was holy. The rest of the nations of the earth were unholy. God was known, the true and living God was known in Israel. He was unknown to those who were outside of Israel. Uh, think of uh, uh, Ephesians 2, where Paul reminds the New Testament church that there was a time when we were categorized as uncircumcised. We were unclean, we were unpure. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That's in Ephesians 2. But now Christ has come, he says, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation and those who have been far off have been brought near. Christ has made the two one, he says. Through his death on the cross, he has reconciled both Jews and outsiders to God. Jew and Gentile believers all now have one common father. And so it is only through the finished work of Jesus Christ that the call of Psalm 96 may be answered. All the earth, that is, all believers from every part of the earth may sing to the Lord a new song. Now, 
why is there this call to sing a new song? Indeed, if we back up a bit, we can ask, why, why call anyone to sing? Why does the Bible call people to sing all the time to the Lord? Well, singing, we have to understand, is a gift that God has given to us by which we may express our emotions. We can sing when we're happy. We can sing when we're sad. Sometimes we sing when we're scared. From earliest times, man has sung what was in his heart. Songs have been written. And all through the Bible, we hear of God's people singing songs of praise to him, or we, we hear them singing songs in which they bewail their situation. They do it in song. Uh, we read the Song of Solomon, which celebrates love and passion. We read of the women singing of David's victory when he returned from slaying Goliath. Um, uh, David has slain, or, or Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And they sang this much to the chagrin of Saul. In the Bible, we find funeral songs, songs of a sense that people would sing as they made their way up to the temple in Jerusalem. We find wedding songs. David even speaks of himself at one point, and this is in Psalm 69, verse 12. David speaks of himself as having become the song of drunkards. And so they made up these funny songs about David mocking him, and when they had had enough of their drink, they would start singing these songs mocking David. The point is, singing is part of the human experience. We express what is in our hearts quite often through singing. That's why we sing in worship. We confess our love for God. We confess our faith in God. We confess that He is our God. The psalms and hymns we sing are not, let's be reminded, first and foremost, for our enjoyment. God is the audience. God, when we come together for corporate worship, God is always the audience. And that's not to say we can't sing songs during the week. Yes, there are nice hymns that we like and we can sing them around our tables or, or uh, when we uh, are doing our work, whatever it may be. But when we come together for corporate worship, we are the choir and God is the audience. We sing to Him, we sing for Him, we sing about Him. And that's why, by the way, it's more important that we not merely sing, not merely mouth the words, but that we sing purposefully. We are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, as Paul says in Colossians 3.16, with gratitude in our hearts to God. That's how we are to sing. That's the attitude of our hearts, um, an attitude of gratitude to God. Worthy of note as well is that David calls us in Psalm 96 to sing a new song. And we actually hear that expression, new song, many times in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And the sense of new song, and this sounds kind of obvious, but the new, sense of new song is to make a distinction from old songs. In the case of Israel, an old song might be what we find in Exodus 15. We're familiar with that. Um, when uh, Moses and the Israelites sing of God's deliverance of Israel from Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they sing of him throwing the horse and rider into the sea, referring to the drowning of the Egyptians in the Red Sea. We might also think of the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, which was very condemning of Israel, calling attention to their ingratitude to God, even though he had been so good to them, warning them of great destruction that would come upon them if they were ever unfaithful to God. And so a new song for Israel would be a contrast to the old songs of condemnation. It would speak of God's grace and forgiveness, his power and his unfailing love. But here, the nations, that's us, are called to sing a new song. And what does that mean for us then? Well, it calls the nations, it calls those outside of Israel, those outside, who are aliens and strangers to the covenant of grace, to leave behind whatever consoled us in the past, and it calls us to look with joy and confidence to the true and living God. A new song for us would be an expression of our changed or transformed life. Those who had not known God now come to know God. And we, so we may sing a new song. We're called to sing a new song that expresses the safety that we now find under the shelter of the Almighty God in contrast to times before when there was unsurety of who we belong to, what we belong to, if we had any hope in these, uh, in these false gods and these false religions. We're to sing a renewed song by which we are abandoning the old superstitions and idolatries of our former lives while we were unconverted. No longer do we sing useless, 
ignorant songs, but songs that express our new status. And what is our new status? Let's remember from 1 Peter chapter 2, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people. We who were once not a people are now the people of God. We who had not obtained mercy have now obtained mercy. And so we are called to sing a new song because we who were formerly spiritually foolish and blind may now bless the Lord. We may sing praises to His name in contrast to the blessing of the name of other gods. Instead of putting our hope and trust in earthly things, we bless the name of the God who is to be praised. The psalmist calls us in verse 2 to proclaim God's salvation from day to day. And the word proclaim is interesting because it, it means to bring good news, to announce. It can even be translated at times to preach. He calls us all to preach God's salvation from day to day. And so he's, it, this psalm is calling every one of us in light of God's deliverance to be heralds, to be messengers, ambassadors, preachers, announcing that deliverance is found in none other than the God of the Bible and in His Son, Jesus Christ. We are to be, as Jesus said, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good deeds and glorify who? Our Father in heaven. We are to live and speak the good news of God's salvation in Christ to all men. With the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we are uh, to declare God's glory among the nations, His wonders among the peoples, as we hear in verse 3. Again, our knowledge of God, or I should say mankind's knowledge of God, is not something that, um, that is known to all. But for us, who have been delivered from darkness, this is not something that we now keep from, for ourselves. We're to live it, we're to tell it to those with whom we have contact, those whom God brings in our path. And let's face it, God's glory and His, His being, His power, is not something that people know automatically or they, they just recognize just by looking around them. God's glory is, is, is something that is because of sin that's hidden from people's eyes. And so the world looks around us and they marvel at how man has evolved from microorganism to fish to salamander to monkey to man over millions of years. The, the world looks at mankind, they look at the world, and this is what they marvel in. They give credit to the Big Bang and natural selection and survival of the fittest and human ingenuity. Fallen man sees everyone as basically good and able to choose good or evil. And each person has the ability and freedom to find his or her own way to inner peace and consolation for now and for the future. And it is only through a radical heart change that we may see God's glory and His salvation and that we may declare His glory. When we speak, boys and girls, of God's glory, we're speaking of His majesty, His power, His splendor, His magnificence. And so we now, are, as God's people, are to declare God's glory to the peoples of the world because we can't just take it for granted that they're going to see it for themselves. It is only through God first condescending to us, stooping down to us, that we are now able to declare His glory and His wonders. And again, that word wonders, as we said last time, um, when it's translated in the Bible, refers to the miracles of God, His unexplainable works that He performs each and every day. And we are to now to declare the glory and the wonders of God to those whom God brings into our path. The psalmist further calls us to, um, in verses 7 to 9, Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the, uh, all the world. And in a way, if you think of the context in which this was written so many thousands of years ago, in a way, this was an amazing call. And yet it really ought not to have been. It's amazing on the one hand because up to that time, of, uh, or up to the time of the coming of Christ, God's covenant was confined to the ethnic nation of Israel. Israel, if we think about it, alone at that time had the know-how and were set up 
to bring true worship to God. And so they had the priests, they had the Ark of the Covenant, they had the altars, they had the sacrifices, they had the history of God's dealing with them and their relationship with God throughout their history. But now, and this is why it's amazing, now God calls the families of the peoples to give to him glory and strength. And when he says, when, when the psalmist here speaks of the families of the peoples, he's not just talking about our immediate families, you know, there's a husband and wife and children, uh, that's a family, but this, the word that's used in the Hebrew extends to whole tribes and clans. And sometimes we, I go to people's house and there, there's a picture on their wall of a family reunion and you have you know, the, great, well, the grandparents, great-grandparents, all their children, all their grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and sometimes they number 150 people, 200 people, 300 people. Um, when you have like a, a family reunion and you take a nice picture of that, hang it on the wall. Um, when we, when, we, when we, think, we hear this word, families of the peoples here, think, for instance, of something like that. Uh, it's speaking of whole tribes, whole clans of people. And we're reminded here how wide is the embrace of God. We're reminded here that God is not stingy with his love. He does not restrict his favor to just a few, but to large groups of outsiders. And these people who had not known him before are now called to give, that is, ascribe to him, credit him with glory and strength. They are to give to him what his name is due, because his name is above every other name. He alone is the true and living God. Nations who in times past had offered their vile offerings to their vile gods are now called to bring an offering and come into the courts of the Lord. When we think of the word offering, boys and girls, what do we think of? We think of the little the quarter, a couple of quarters, or the loony that mom or dad gave us this morning, put it, put it in our pockets, and so when the offering bag is uh, passed around, we'll drop it in there. Um, and we often think of offering in that way, and that's, that's good. But we have to remember that it's not just the physical act of dropping that, those coins or whatever it may be, the token, into the offering bag. It's not just the physical act that God is looking for. He wants to see the love and gratitude in your heart. And he wants to see that you give this as, because you recognize that, this, that, that uh, we are his children, that he has blessed us so richly, and so we're giving to him... Um, uh, an expression of our thankfulness and our recognition that, that uh, he is good and he is well provided for us. And, and we have to realize that we are very privileged to do that. We, who are outside of God's people, are now called to bring an offering and come into God's house. And we are to bring that offering, as we said, with an attitude of love and thankfulness in our hearts. The psalmist calls us also to worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. And the word translated uh, beauty in the Hebrew has to do with clothing. It would be the kind of, of word that you would use if you're explaining how somebody dressed up in their finest clothes, say on their wedding day, and they were just looking very gorgeous, very handsome. Uh, it's the kind of word you would use in a context like that, or if you think of the, uh, a, a queen or a king dressed in their festal robes, uh, this kind of language you would use. Um, the, it, it has to do with... Uh, with, uh, with clothing, the way someone is dressed up. And the sense here is that we are to worship God with the understanding that he is dressed up, that he is clothed, but he is dressed in holiness. And so we are to come worshiping him with this in mind. We are to worship the Lord in the splendor, in the beauty of his holiness. In congregation in Psalm 96, God was calling the nations to acknowledge him with praise and adoration. But again... When these words were penned originally, the nations had no way of responding to that call. And so this psalm, we have to understand, was pointing forward to the day when blind, deaf, and dead sinners would be enabled to believe in the true God and bless His name and give to Him what was His right to receive. And Psalm 96 indicates that that day would come, and it has we are now evidence as we sit here this morning and all the churches of Jesus Christ all across the world where they, the name of Jesus Christ is called upon. We are now evidence that what the Lord determines to do, He will do. The nations are now turning to the true God. 
But as the true God calls the nations to acknowledge him, we see in the second place that they, that is we, are to do so with fear and awe. In verses 4 to 6 we read, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And again, please notice that the sacred name of Israel's God is used here. Yahweh in the Hebrew. And it's used to make a distinction, a differentiation. He is great and greatly to be praised. The word translated great has a sense of importance, power, influence. It speaks of his ac excellence and magnificence. But in the context of these verses, it's meant to convey the surpassing greatness of the Lord compared to the gods of the nations that they believed in. The Lord is to be distinguished and raised above the so-called greatness of the false gods. Of course he is. The Lord is the possessor of, a, of the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalm 63 verse 3 says, Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit to you. His greatness, says Psalm 145 verse 3, is unsearchable. None can save like the Lord our God, who with a mighty hand and outstretched arm delivered his people Israel from the oppression of Pharaoh, who defeated countless Midianites by the hand of Gideon and 300 men, who struck down mighty armies without breaking a sweat, who thundered upon his enemies so that they fled in terror. And so no God is great as our God. And so this God, whom the nations are now called to confess and worship, is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And again, boys and girls, this does not mean that there are other gods that exist. Uh, it's not, it doesn't mean here that all gods are to be feared, but God is to be feared the most. That's not what it's saying. It's saying uh, we, we know that God alone is God. He alone is deserving of reverence. He alone is deserving of our humbling of our hearts before Him, bowing our souls in the recognition that He alone is God. Indeed, as the psalmist says, all the gods of the peoples are idols. And the, the word in the Hebrew that's used, that's translated idols in our Bibles, is uh, kind of a mocking kind of a word, kind of a contemptuous word. The word uh, that's translated idols means it can be literally translated no thing. Idols can be literally, literally translated no thing. And so God is saying the, I, the gods of the, of the nations are no things. They're nothing. They're useless. They're no good. Uh, think of if someone handed you an invisible hammer because you wanted to hammer in a nail into a wall. You say, well, what good is this? What is this going to do me? I, I'm, I'm going like this and nothing is happening. Uh, that's kind of the picture here we, we're, we're given, that idols of the nations were nothing. They were useless. They were no good. Uh, they were of no value. And so the word is used in very strong contempt of the gods of the nations. Baal, Asherah, Dagon, Molech, and to think of today, all the gods of the false religions, including evolution and so-called global warming, or the idols that people worship like self, money, careers, beauty, spirituality. All of these are useless idols uh, and are of no help whatsoever. But the Lord made the heavens. He is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Verse 10 instructs us to confess that the Lord reigns. We're reminded that the world is firmly established by him. It shall not be moved. And so troubles, sorrows, evil, natural disasters, the insanities of this world, governments changing, all of these things are under God's firm control and him alone. In him all things exist and continue to exist. Honor and majesty, that is what is befitting to a king. And indeed, God is the king of kings. Honor and majesty belong to him alone. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Now, in the original context, this would have referred to the tabernacle and later the temple in Israel. It was here at the temple or the tabernacle that the presence of God could be found and his favor could be sought through the sacrifices and through the priests. But Jesus comes along and he speaks of a day when all true worshipers would worship in spirit and in truth. Not in Jerusalem or in Samaria as the Samaritans thought, but he said everywhere. And congregation, that day has come. And the strength 
and beauty of God's sanctuary is found not in one isolated place in the world, but wherever God's people gather in the name of Jesus Christ. As we join our hearts and voices together, as we listen to God's word read and preached, as we confess our sins together and we hear the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins in Christ Jesus, we now, through the power of Christ's Holy Spirit, we experience the strength and beauty of God's sanctuary. And we wait for the day when all creation will celebrate the one true God. In verses uh, 11 and following, uh, the heavens and the earth, the seas, the fields, even the trees are called to rejoice before the Lord. What does that mean? Well, we know from Genesis 3 that the ground was cursed because of Adam's sin. And then Paul reminds us in Romans 8, verse 21 and following, that the creation waits to be delivered from bondage. In the meantime, he says, the creation groans and labors with birth pangs. But the Lord Jesus, so the, the creation is in a fallen state, and it groans and it waits for the time of redemption, but the Lord Jesus has begun the process of restoration by giving his sinful li sin sinless life for a sinful world. And one day, he will come again to judge the earth, as we hear in verse 13, and that is to govern the earth. And he will do so with righteousness. He will not be a harsh taskmaster. He will not be a dictator. He will rule with perfect justice and love. And the whole creation will rejoice together on that day. In fact, in Revelation 5 speaks of the joy of the church at that time. Uh, Revelation 5 verses 9 to 10 we read, And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy, this is singing to the Lamb, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so, Church of God, we are the fulfillment of Psalm 96. And we are the ones who are addressed directly here. In contrast to, say, Psalm 95, which is an invitation to Israel to worship their God based on his doings among them, Psalm 96 speaks to outsiders like you and I. But something had to happen first. Because apart from the powerful regeneration of our hearts by Christ's Holy Spirit, we, the nations, that is those outside of Israel, would have had no way of responding to God's invitation because by nature we are spiritually blind and dead. But Christ has come and he has died for our sins and his Holy Spirit has been poured out and Gentiles like us, strangers and aliens to God's covenant of grace, have been enabled to believe in the true and living God. Let us listen to this call of God. Let us come to him in faith and let us confess that he alone is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice as your people. As your people who have been called out of darkness into your most wonderful light. We rejoice that you have taken notice of us, that you have had mercy on us and that it was always your intention, as we hear, indeed, all through the Old Testament, to bless the nations and to bring in from among the Gentiles those who would come to faith in Jesus Christ and who would acknowledge you as the true and living God and ascribe to you glory and praise. We thank you, Father, that on this day, on this Lord's Day, as we gather together to worship you, we may experience the, the beauty and strength of your sanctuary, that we may know that in Christ we are in your presence and we may receive a taste, indeed a foretaste, of the eternal Sabbath and of the joy that belongs to those who belong to you. Bless us that we may, indeed, as we, this psalm calls us, uh, call all peoples around us to worship the one and true God, the only God, and help us to be that salt and light and leaven that we are called to be in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's